I'll just say it because I think it's best to just actual processing first. And I am just what the processor looks like is because that's what we're going to be using for the rest of the semester. So this is kind of like the overview of the Sakai processor. Uh, some of these components we have on a couple of tests for a couple of weeks, like this one here. The rest of the semester is going to be done. Okay, I'll see you To understand how the processor itself works, we're going to need to understand the, how the components work. These are the registers pretty much done already by actual systems. We will click through today as well. Um, but there are many other components, I should say, but there are many other components as well. And then we will understand how they work so that we can understand how the processor works in general. So that's going to be the focus of today. All right, so I am going to start a so that I can focus on one type of data type. The first one I want to talk about is called a multiplexer. So in order to use this one, you don't need to select it. You can just click on the multiplexer and then you can select the data type. Let me check it itself. It will magnify a lot so that we can see so that we can see what it is. So a multiplexer is like a railroad switch, but in this direction. So in this case we have multiple trains coming across and only one output. But it does the purpose of a railroad track so that when there are multiple trains arriving at the switch, you can choose and go like, okay, this train can go through the switch so that it can go to the other side and then all the other trains can go over and talk to the other train. So is the concept okay? You know, does everybody understand what a railroad switch is and the purpose of a railroad switch? Questions about that? Oh, darn it. I was, I was hoping we could make a field trip to the uh, railroad museum in downtown Sacramento so that you guys can actually see that stuff. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so let's take a look at the um, properties of a multiplexer. The first one is not really super important, it's just the facing. In other words, you can rotate it. The second one is also just the components as well. You can see the flow is where the trains will appear. You can click on the trains appear to go to the top. Or after you rotate it, you can appear on the left hand side or the right hand side. Not terribly, you know, important. They're just controlling the look of a multiplexer. Starting with the third one, which is the selected, that is starting to become easy. The selected, you basically specify how many pins do you use specify which input gets to the output of a multiplexer. With only one pin, I can choose between bit zero, um, input 0 and input 1. But then with two bits, I can you know, switch between input 0, 1, 2, or 3, because you know, with two bits, you can specify an, un an unsigned number from 0, 0, or 1 in the time range, which is like basically 3. So can someone tell me what happens when that's true? selected, you know, which, how many input ports can I select out? Eight is correct, because it's two to the power of eight, okay, so it's two to the power. No, two to the power of three is eight. Okay, so you can easily you know, select three, then you can select any one of the uh, eight input ports to connect to the output port. Okay, so we're going to, you know, space it two, you know, just to make the logic and I'm going to skip disabled output and talk about enabled first. So this is the select um, port, and this is the enable. The enable port is optional. It means if you don't want to use the port, you can also unable the other one. So enable port is optional. Sometimes it basically means it is not on 
which also means none of the input is going to come. Is that okay? Does everybody understand uh, the book of the table? Okay, so with the enable port on, then one of the four is always passing through to the output. With, with the enable port off, then none of the input goes to the output. Well, if none of the input is going to the output, then what it is what is the output in? Because if we are not disconnecting the output in, the output port is always gonna be in. The question is what is presented to the output when the book is running to the output. And that is specified by the second to the last of the attributes. It is either floating or it is outputting the table. So let me just explain what floating means to you so you can actually make it clearer. It simply means it's not connected to anything in the output. You can specify what it means if you want to go to the table. You can just say, I'm not, I'm not doing what you say you're doing. Okay? I'm not driving in one way or the other. Okay? Yeah, that's also a term that you can use in electrical engineering. It's are we driving it to be a high voltage or are we driving it to a low voltage? In other words, are we putting any effort on the conductor to say that it should be a high should be a low. Floating means we are, we're just going like, eh, either way. Think of this as you going to uh, choose a restaurant with all your friends. Okay? So let's say there are two restaurants to choose from. One is called one, the other one is called zero. Okay, so two restaurants. And you're asked, which one do you want to go? If you specify one or zero, that means you are expressing an opinion. But on the other hand, if you want to go floating, you're simply saying, ah, I don't care. Okay, where, wherever the group wants to choose is fine with me. That is what floating means. Are we good with you know, what floating means? Yep. Select. So I have just explained every single function that you gave me with a number of decimals. So you can basically make it in one all the way up. Okay, so those are two. So that means that is just controlling the width of the bit width of each port. So the four input and the one output port are all affected by the number of decimals. So that that's basically the you know, saying how many uh, how many rails here per track, then you can um, you can potentially have some gigantic train coming through that has the number of rails each of them is going to be doing. All right. So now let me go ahead and show you how you find some additional description of this thing. Go to help, go to library reference. Okay, let me show you one more thing that you can do. Show to the middle of the screen. What library reference looks like. So what you need to do is go to Reading um, Flexor again. And then you go to Multiplexor. And this is the full description of what the multiplexor is, what each port is doing, and so on. Okay, so in case you find my description is something that this is also a way for you to kind of find an alternative description of the same thing. So, are there, do we have any questions before I proceed with the short demonstration of the next thing? Okay, no questions. I will quickly close that. So, let's go ahead and make a couple of demonstrations of this kind of thing. Okay, let's go to this. So, I will need three pins that, four pins, sorry, four input pins that connect each connection to the input table to the board. So, they all have
always under the frame that can be very different frame that within you know whatever is under or next to it is something like this. I did another one to enable because when this one does have the enable to the probe, I did it like a box and the table. And now I need a, a three bit output pin in order to demonstrate what is actually what is the this reflector. Circuit is already running. Its output is ten ten ten. And not only is it off, I also specified that when it is off, the output is supposed to be floating. So an X is representing. You, know, you don't know exactly what whether it's a zero or one because in this particular device we did not specify either one. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what the circuit? Okay, so the first thing we can do is to say, oh, I will keep everything except you know the default output is going to be zero. Well, that's kind of obvious what it's going to do, because even though the device or the motor reflector is still off right now, but because we specify the disabled output to be zero, so that's why the output is off. So this becomes useful or important in certain parts of the processor, because there may be other things. which means we are selecting input 2 to connect to input 2 to output. What is the signal, or what is the value of the input pin connected to the set input 2? It's 1, 0, 0, because we count from, we count from 0. Now why, how do we know we count from 0? How do we memorize that? The answer is no, you do not memorize. I turn it on, then input 2, which has a value of 1, 0, 0, because that's the input value, should present to the output pin of the motor reflector. That's exactly what it does. So are we good at this point about what a motor reflector does? Yes? Okay. So a motor reflector is a very single register, but there are multiple pathways that connect to the register. It allows us to choose how we are going to update the reflector. So that's why it is a very important and useful function inside the processor. Are we good so far? All right. So once again, you know, if you need to refer to the internal you know, help, the way to get to it is to go to help, the library reference, The next one is something that we've seen already, but 
still mean that you have to really think about the effect. Just the expression of the memory of the content. We should kind of know what a register does. But we're going to talk about it in the next video. So a register has four attributes. Actually, this is one of the few simplest functions. But you cannot run anything. And the trigger is the one, the little wedge or triangle here. That is the person who is not the dumb at the top. The CMK um, input pin of a edge sensitive sequence block is basically what we think about. Um, you can put a label, which means you can change the name. That means you can not be relevant in this, in this case. So you can change the label function. And also the function does the same for the label also. Now we look at all the other points of the register. Let's talk about the power. This is Z port. This is the input. It is equivalent to the Z port of Z foot block. And then the next one is EN, which is the label, which is also equivalent to the EN of a Z foot block. And the next one is Q, which is also equivalent to the Q port of a Z foot block. Since of a Z foot block reflects the state of Z foot block. And finally, we have is also known as clear rule reset. Okay, so no matter what you do with all of the other pins. It's also you know, what reset is doing in our extendable input block or input block. So what we do okay so far with this is we connect to this a little bit, okay, you know, there's not much we need to do with this because we did that quite a few times already. It's a rectangle. So that means whatever you type right now, as long as it is an extra decimal digit that each digit can take you know, in the register, you can just overtype. For instance, if I want to change this to EM, I can just simply type EM on the keyboard and it changes to EM in extra decimal. D is 1011, F is 1111. You can see how it changes the state right away. But this won't work if I Insert the reset pin. This is the reset pin, also known as the clear or zero pin. So as long as F is in the one, I can only type in this case because you know, even though I'm typing on the keyboard, but because the device is asking me to reset it with its own value of zero zero, so it would appear that I cannot type in. When the computer first start up, the reset pin is going to be asserted. You know, it's going to be one by a certain amount of time by hundreds of milliseconds, which is a fraction of a second, in order for every device on the computer to reset to its own state right now. So no, most of the time, we don't want to do that. We want to actually type in the number. So let's just say that I want the register to store a value of 6 C, so 6 C, because 6 is 0, 1, 1, 0, and then C is 1, 1, 0, 0 space 2. So in order to First thing I need to do is to enable, okay, to enable the reset pin to one, and then I need to make sure that it has a zero to one transition of the one. But how is the register to just update it so that it is 60 and then it outputs a transition of the one? Is that okay? So 
I turn up the enable, I can either turn to change the input to anywhere I want, and I can also either change the clock to anywhere I want. It doesn't have to be because this is also the behavior of a set of a net sensitive but dated input clock. Now in this uh, module. Questions about the functions of a record. It's a device that, in this case, capable of remembering a byte. But in order to tell it to remember a byte, one, you have to present what it's supposed to remember at the beginning. Two, you need to enable it by returning the end to the square one. And then three, the clock pin has to go from zero to one. At the instant of the clock pin. Zero to one, it will remember whatever the input is presented, and at this point, it will also output the contents at the same time, updating and outputting. All right. So, do we have any questions about how a record works? about the record keeping. Right? So the two these two are the ones that are in today's lab, but we since we have time, we can keep quite a bit of time. So we're gonna talk about some of the other components of the clock itself as well. The next one is called a lock or a lock. And this is the same thing again. The purpose is having what clock is in the context of a computer. Okay, so let's pick up the question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's going to be reading or reading from the screen. Okay. Let's check out what what this what type of attribute do we have in the end of the day. Okay, so the one the first one is address. locations inside and each one can have its own unique input. Okay, so but in many ways it is like an initialized array in this function. Are we good with that concept? What is initialized array in this function? Does anybody know what that concept is? So it's kind of like that. But the number of elements specified in this attribute here, it is specified indirectly by the address bit here. But 8 bit, 8 binary digit, how many locations can I have? In other words, is each location, if you think about each location as an element in an array, since I am using an index of 8 bits, I can select how, uh, I say, I can select one of how many is the largest size of the array so that I can use an extreme index to select any one of the elements. This relates to some math that we did earlier. Does everybody understand my question? Okay. So let me write it out for you.
That means as it is, this ROM has up to te two Tetris execution systems in its own location. We go through the address, which is the width of the execution array in the KBIT language. So I'm going to test you guys a little bit here. If I change this to a weird number like 5, how many locations are in the ROM? Two to the power of 5, which it is. Pieces of paper because they can they, they can calculate two times two times two times two times two. Times two. Everybody do this the correct answer. So in this case, we have thirty-two locations in the ROM. Now, what about you know how much can each location remember? Then it is controlled by the data bit width. So the data bit width goes automatically. If I want you know, each location to remember a certain string to 12 bit, I can do so. So at this point, this particular ROM has 32 locations, and each location has one bit. So each location can specify in decimals from 0 up to 10,000 and 95. Because that's what two to the power of 12 minus. So far, all right, all right. So with a ROM, there are things that you can do with it. So if I change this back to a string, uh, now we have 64 locations. Now, if, if you want to change the content of ROM, okay, you can actually click on it and change it. But at this point, you can only change change up to location seven. I, I know this is location seven because on the left hand side, these are the addresses of the left-hand side of the rectangle. So that means you know, this is location 4, but then the next one is going to be location 5. This is location 6, this is location 7. But what about the rest of the locations in the ROM? I cannot access those in this one. So the way to change the other location is to right-click on the ROM, go to Edit Content. Okay. So in the Content Editor, it shows up in a little in the bottom first. So we go right to the screen. So when you look at the content editor or the text, so the editor, the way you read it is kind of the same way. These are the addresses of the first item on each row. So that means that this item is at location two zero, not twenty. These are all in hexadecimal. So this is location two one two 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 three and so on. All right. So I'm going to test you guys. What the, what is the location? What is the address of this location? Gonna take some counting. You can count backwards on this. Okay, seven. It is not counting. I think seven. Okay. How many locations is it doing? Zero hexadecimal e decimal in the space ten. Sixteen, that is correct. So each row has sixteen locations. So that means that the location that I have selected here is the furthest remove. Okay, from the current address. So that means that this is location one F, this is location one E, this is location one E. Counting backwards is easier this way because it's closer to the end. So everything along here is location S of that row. So that's why it's easier to count this way. But if you want to count from the beginning, that works too. This is location 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, times you need to go into the memory location and change the one location. So 
not so much with the ROM of the processor, but with the RAM of the processor. Okay, but it works the same thing as the processor. All right, so now that we know how to change the contents of the ROM, let's go ahead and change a few here just so that we can see what the fun the content is. So if I do the FD and the change it in the adjustment size. So it is just the it's not actually selecting, it's actually called chip selecting. Which means is is this chip supposed to be active? Is it supposed to be doing something? So that's what the SEL is trying to specify. So think of this SEL as being active, but it's really actually just a selection of enable, not so much a selection. The A port, as we have already talked about, is um, specifying you know, which location you want to address. So the width of this input pin depends on the width of the A port. So if I make a connection and then and there's a mismatch, I have to change this one to stay. Okay, so that allows me to select any one of the six four locations in this particular ROM. The output on the other hand depends on how uh, wide is each location. And the way we set it up is each location has 12 bits. So that's going to be changed to the output pin also to that. So, so these are all X's here because when they draw, this is going to be only the output pin. So in other words, the chip is trying its best to say, pretend that I'm not even here. Okay? So if you want to select a location, you have to enable it. Specify which location you want to like the content of which location to be presented to the device. So in this particular case, let's just say that okay, we don't have any such content. Let's say I want the one FE to appear on the output. The question is how should I change the input pin over here to the one FE to make it so that the output is the one FE. In to make that happen. Okay, is that everything correct? Now we can see the fact that okay, we can specify to be seven the hexadecimal. Zero one 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 to specify the location. Very good, that is correct. And then we just enable the chip. Now it outputs one zero 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 one one hexadecimal. One 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 is an F in hexadecimal. One 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 zero is an E in hexadecimal, which means it's approximately the same data. It also tells you, you know, that when a location is selected and the device is enabled because it will actually highlight the location when it's in output. So that's, that's really important. Is that okay? So the best way to understand the ROM, just imagine it to be a digital version of the real ROM. Okay. That's how I would understand it. Um, and then you can look here. And then, of course, if you want to do something else, you can do so too. Is also understanding the information of the ROM and the specification of the ROM. So the ROM is what the device is used for and the type of device it is. Okay, so 
Oh, it's going to yell at you to make a brain because you have a mismatch of which of the two kids and the age you are supposed to be the one. Because you have the largest in active and the least in active, you try to make sure first that the width of one particular point matches the width of the other. That's why it catches this yell. It, it won't let you. Are we good with ROM? So let's talk about the other side of a multiplexer. It is called a demultiplexer. That's another term that we use when we talk about the multiplexer. Because a demultiplexer is also called a multiplexer if you're thinking about the upper and the lower. So in this case, we're going to go to flexor and pick up the demultiplexer. Like so. And so when you look at a demultiplexer, I think you should see some examples here. So this is the same thing. So I'm going to pick the okay. So this is the select and also the enable. You also have the number of delegates. You also have, the, in this case, there's an extra one called free space. I will explain that in just a little bit. You also see the enable output, just like with a multiplexer. And you also see the delete enable. So those are all basically the same thing. If I change the select bit to three, what happens if you just dump the whole thing? Currently, there are only two outputs because with one selected, I can only select output zero or output one. If I have three selected, you know, how many output ports should I expect to see? Eight. Eight. That is correct. Okay, very good. So it serves basically the same purpose. So a demultiplexer is also like a rainbow switch, except in this case you have one track coming in the switch, and there are eight switch eight uh, tracks going out of the switch. Is that okay? So that means you know, it's kind of like a hub. Okay, you know, think of it as a hub. So when a train comes in into this particular switch, you can say, oh, you know, output zero or track one of the output goes to a station, so that if it's a passenger train, people can hop on. Cars. Uh, track number one goes to a mill. Okay, so you can fill it in with a couple of trains. Uh, track two goes to a you know, manufacturing plant so that you can pick up or drop off parts and so on and so forth. So it's basically the same thing as a switch except you have one incoming track and then you have you know, up to, and so on. I like to think of it as up to two to the power of three of output. Is that okay? All right. So let's go ahead and make this one a little bit more simpler. So we're going to have the three selected. So we have four output ports. And then we have the three select three data bits. And then we have the output. I will talk about the free state in just a little bit because you know, that's the most important thing right now. So it has one single input track. Okay, so that means I have one single three bit input pin. Input here. Uh, it has another input for the enable. So the enable is this little bit right over here. I need two bits in the select because I have four output selector. So I need these two bits to go into here to get the data bit. Input input. Input input. Input input. 
the other three. I'm referring to this one, this one, and this one. This one we kind of know, okay, because you know, we know this is going to be 0, 1, 1. What about the other three? This one depends on this one depends on one thing that we have not talked about, which is the three states. So if you if you go back to the multiply chart, you see that the three state here is but it says no. So if three state is no, then All be zeros. On the other hand, if I specify yes, unselected output of an enabled demultiplexer will be floating. Most of the time, that's what you want to do. That is correct. You don't want to choose what the output. Everybody else may have the same thing. Say, hey, can you confirm this? Oh, cool. Okay. But we also want to confirm the other way. What if if we are part of the three state? If I change the three state to a yes, then what you see as x x x will on those three output pins will become zero zero. Is that okay? So the A selector. Yeah. It's not a broadcaster, but it's a selector. Yep. outside of the context of this class, so don't worry about what I'm about to say. So it's kind of the same as a network switch. Because a network switch is also a multiplexer and also a demultiplexer. That's a little more than that because a network switch can also broadcast because you understand the broadcasting too. So it's, a, it's doing it slightly more than just a multiplexer. But the best way to think about the is they are just frame functions. Basically, they're, they allow, if you have a bunch of these things, it allows you to plan a route between one point to another point. Okay? If you think about trains, okay, if you think about trains, so imagine trains that are really, really fast, like at the speed of light. Okay? So if you want you know, this particular train from, let's say, San Francisco to go to a particular place in Boston. Okay, so there are many rails in between. There are a lot of tracks in between, and you know, because the whole thing is a network, right? You know, it's a mesh. So now what you need to do is to pre-select, okay, all the um, all the switches along the way, and you're plotting a course from San Francisco to Boston. So you make all the switch arrangements. Okay, after you make all the arrangements, then you go like go. Okay. Train, which is traveling at light speed, you call it you go from San Francisco to Boston. And then the next you know, uh, instance that you want to, uh, the next instance for using the track, maybe you're going from, say, Sacramento to uh, Memphis. Okay, Memphis. So now you basically do the configuration again, and then after the configuration is done, then you say go. And then the train goes like that. So the processor is a big gigantic network, just like you know the rail, the rail tracks in the station. Okay, and whenever you want to connect a particular component to another desti destination, you have to switch switches in between so that you establish a path. 
Is that okay? So switches are basically just the most basic mechanism for clocking a switch, a component inside the circuit. That's the most basic one. Okay. Right. <clears throat> All right. So let's see. Got anything else here? Any questions? Any concerns? Okay. This one is RAM. Okay. So we're gonna go to memory again. Pick up the RAM. This one is probably the most a lot of pins, but at the same time, you can kind of look at this as a computer. Register, and in some ways, that's what a computer is. So what we'll do is we're going to first take a look at in the um, contents. So as it is, if I go to edit contents, this thing has 256 locations because it has an eight. What does it mean? What is RAM? What is R? What is A? And what is M? Yes. It is random access memory. That is correct. So random access in this case, I suppose, means that your access can be a read, can also be a write. Okay. So unlike a ROM, which is a read-only memory, which means you can only get the content out of the ROM, but you cannot change it. Okay. At least not with a real device, because in the simulator, yes, you can go ahead and click it and change it if you want. But with a wrong actual device or chip, you can only read the content. With RAM, you can actually change the content on the fly. Okay? In other words, the whatever circuit you're designing that has a RAM component in it, the circuit has mechanism to change the content in the RAM. So in this case, you know, we have 256 locations. The way you read Addresses would be the same. Let me just click on one and then try to figure out what the other one is. Okay, picking it up. So, can someone tell me what is the address of the location that I have to go to? Come forward, which is a little bit more cumbersome to get to it. You can also come backwards, which means you know the last row or the last column. So far, all right. So now, okay. So it looks like a ROM in some sense because it has multiple locations. It has the address location, it has the parameter selection location. It has, but on the other hand, it also has a select. Now this select is also called chip select. It has the letter E and N. Okay, so think of this as E and N of a register. And then you see this little web symbol again. Context of a register. What is the name of this section of the RAM register? It's not the enable. It's the clock. Okay, it is the clock. So it is kind of like a register because it also takes a lot of transition to update the content of a location. It also has a clear. So you can see it's a zero label. If this clear CLR is a one, then the content of the RAM will all be set to this. It resets every location to zero, not just the one that you have selected. So the entire thing goes all the way back to zero. It has a data port, which is kind of like the data port of the ROM. Okay, so you can basically say, oh, I want to get this information from the ROM, and then it sends it to the ROM. Okay, so it can act just like a ROM, but then. It has this pin over here. So this pin is super important because it determines the direction of the access. In other words, are we reading the content of the RAM or are we also writing a table in a integrated a location in the RAM? So it allows you to select which way you want it to be selected. So 
So now we're going to play with this a little bit. This one from lab related to RAM is on Wednesday, so it's not today. So I'm going to play with this. This gives you a chance to review this before uh, Wednesday. So by Wednesday, you'll be able to have an easier time to manage that lab. Okay, so I'm keeping everything as in default. It means you know, they have eight address space with an office. Each location office only has eight. All right, now we have a whole bunch of single grid cases here. Detecting every single location. Just like the ROM, you can part the code to location, you can part them into locations. I can change this one to a 1P if I want to, change this to an ETF for no particular reason, change this to an SM2. And so on. Okay, so you can certainly do that. But if you observe the clear pin, which is here, now the chip does not even need to be selected. As soon as you clear in the one, every single location in the RAM is going to disappear. Not just the one that's missing. You can always you know, always take it back to zero. Okay. So first things first. How do we read you know, something from the RAM? It's exactly the same. Almost exactly the same as a ROM. Okay, let's put the location value first. It's just going to be zero. So we'll change this one to nine B. Okay, so nine B is a one zero zero one. That's a nine, and then B is a one zero zero one one. So B one is zero one zero zero one. And the first we, the first thing we need to know is what is the location? What is the nine? What is nine B at the at the value? What is the location of that? Value? is a zero A. Okay? Zero A at the location. This is zero and A is one zero one zero. So now I have selected the address. And then the next thing you need to do is to specify are we reading or are we writing? If you hover your mouse pointer, it will tell you that this is reading. Load reading. If one, we are reading. Okay, load memory to data point is equal to reading. So we want this to or read operation. That's all that this does. All I have to do this next is to enable the select. Remember this STL is actually the end. Okay, we're enabling the device and now the output oh this one thing. This is zero nine. Okay. Not bad. Location time. Right, this is fine. Are we good so far? So the reading part is almost exactly the same as a ROM, except because otherwise it would just be clearing the content and not giving you anything. All right. So, what about overwriting the location? Well, that gets a little bit complicated. So let's just say that you. Know, I want to use all of these pins to change, let's say, this location to a 7 C. So there are a few things that are easy to figure out. What is the address of the location that I'm using? Present zero seven to the address one. Zero seven is zero 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 and then zero one one one. Okay, that's pretty easy to do. Next I need to make sure the LD pin is a zero to specify this is a right operation. Done. Uh, the RAM is usually you know the default is it's And 
I can even enable the whole thing right now. So I can enable the chip by pressing the select key one. It is now selecting the location zero zero. It is saying I'm ready to update that location. The big question is, um, but where do we present the location? So how do we write the key of seven data in location seven to the content of seven key? Something has to specify. turns out the data pin here, the D pin, is bi-directional. It can act as an output if I'm reading, but it can also act as an input if I'm doing input writing. But tech, this is not an input, that's not an input pin, it's an output pin. You cannot change anything in an output pin because all it's doing is to be like when it's presented to the wire. Okay? So like, ah, okay, maybe we have to do something about the circuit now. So I'm going to disconnect okay, the output pin, set it to the side, then you're like, oh, okay, maybe we need an input pin to do this now. We can maybe why? Why? Then connect it to this D port, okay, like so. And then this time we change the content to exactly what we specified earlier, 7C, 0, 1, 1, 1. Now, finally, we are ready to uh, make the clock in. We can go from 0 to 1, so it becomes a write again. And now the location is the 7C. Cool. Yes, it is kind of cool that we can, you know, just by exercising the pins, change the location of the clock. Okay. What happens if we do this first thing first? Well, I kind of lied. We did not actually have to do that. We could have actually quite easily with this connection three-way. It doesn't hurt anything. In other words, the output pin is simply saying, hey, whatever this node has, I just need to tell you what the content is. So it's not a problem. The problem is, what if I want to uh, read again? Okay, so let's say this time I want to read the line again. Okay, well, but check, you always know so if you read the 9D, it's always good to disable the RAM first, okay, so that it doesn't do anything while we are messing around. So the 9D is at location uh, 0, 9, okay, so we change the address to that to 0, 9. We are reading, so the 9D is 1. The clock pin really doesn't matter because we are reading. And then we just say, okay, now we select. Oh, we have a problem. Okay, you can see the red color here. So all the locations, all the bit positions that you see a D, which stands for error, is basically saying what size or the position of the RAM is specifying you know, something that is different from what the input pin is trying to tell us. Okay, so every letter D is reflecting a constant. So we'll take a look at one of them. We'll take a look at the left most one. This is a D because the input pin said it has to be a zero, but when you look at nine, it starts with a one. So that means this port is trying to specify a one for the most significant bit or bit seven. This source is trying to specify a zero. So now you have what we call a bus byte. I'm not kidding you, this is actually called a bus byte. Okay, you have two components trying to specify a different value In terms of real circuit, what do you think is going to happen? You have one chip trying to drive the node to a one, which means a higher voltage, and you have another device trying to drive exactly the same node in the circuit to a low voltage. So what, what happens when you have something that wants to drive the pin high and the other one trying to drive the pin low? An oscillation. Okay, it's the same thing as what happens. Do not do this. What happens when you do 
wires and wires to connect the two terminals of a call battery. As I said, do not do this, okay? It is bad. Okay, but what happens? That's what you notice. Well, it will start with a, with a big old spark, and then what happens? No, 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 no. It's only 12 volts. What happens when you have a lot of current passing through a conductor? Okay, in the winter, okay, I know this is the wrong season, okay? In the winter, you take out a heater, one of those electric heaters, right? And then you turn it on, you see a light glow of red, okay? So what makes that glow? Why is it glowing? Because you have a lot of current passing through a conductor that has some resistance. So copper wire, which is a jumper in the winter, is a very good conductor, but it still has some resistance. Okay? So that means when you connect the two terminals of a call battery, there will be a lot of current passing through the wire. That's what you can see the heat up. So you can say, but how hot is it going to get? Put on winning top. Okay? So that means the first thing you need is insulation material. Then it will boil, and then the plastic is just going to burn. That's something that you need to know. And what happens after that? It kind of depends on the battery, because the battery can heat up too. Okay? And car batteries have this uh, sulfuric acid. Okay? It's, a, it's basically uh, lead plates. So that sulfuric acid will also heat up to the point where you can see the heat. And that's going to put out basically sulfuric acid is going to vaporize, okay, and, you know, the, it, the whole thing is steam, is the steam that actually works, because what happens is you have all that liquid heating up, you know, it wants to do a phase change into gas, but there's no room because it's steam, so what's going to happen? It's going to explode at some point. It does explode, and you end up with sulfuric acid splashed all over. Transistors in here. Basically, what is happening is you have the power and the ground connected in between two transistors. It doesn't matter whether they're both coming from the same transistor, but you have a bunch of transistors in between. They're all on. Okay. Transistors also have resistance, so that means they are going to heat up. You ask to what degree? To the t to a tuning fork. And then your chip dies. So it depends on the chip too, because in most cases, you know, when you have tiny little transistors, you know, that are five um, nanometer across, it's not gonna. You, you cannot see anything except the chip doesn't work. Okay. On the other hand, if the transistors are bigger, like you know, in the case of a audio amplifier, if you use that kind of you know, transistor to make a circuit like this, then the chip is transistor itself would actually blow up. Bad things will happen. In other words, in short, we don't want to do this. Okay? So go like, okay, but how can we make this happen? Because you know, in order to read, I need the output pin. In order to write, I need the input pin. So they are both needed. So what we need to do here is to introduce the concept of a clutch. You heard me right. Okay, I said clutch. Well, most people will say, what is a clutch? A clutch is basically a word called a buffer. A buffer, I should take it back, it's not a buffer, it, is, it has to be a control buffer. So it has to be a control buffer. So a control buffer is kind of like a digital uh, collector.
and then the uh, specification of a disabled um, buffer is always in the book. Okay. So, and then we also need one more thing. We need a dot h. Okay. So this does get a little bit complicated. The dot gauge is the gating, whether we are reading and writing, and that in return is controlling whether the buffer is passing through whatever is input to have the output, or whether it's just floating the output to the audio source. Yes? Yeah. So what the way we do this is we take this away, and this diagram is going to get a little bit ugly. Let me explain in another way. So right now, you can think of this as a switch. Right now, it is off. So that means the input, which is coming from the input pin, is not connected to the output in any way. So that means this wire is not being specified by the control buffer. And as a result, the RAM, the need for the RAM can now say, oh, I can present whatever I want without any interference from the input pin because this wire does not have anything coming out of the buffer. On the other hand, if you want to specify a write operation, you want to change the content of RAM, okay, so let's do that. So we can go ahead and turn off this write, okay, turn off everything. So let's just say that this time I want to change this location, which is location F, to another content. Location F, I want to change it to, let's say, one, two, okay? So this is one and two. So I use this input pin to specify the new content of the location or the new content of the location. So now I need to specify what? I need to specify the address, okay? This is location F. So that means the address has to be zero, 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 zero for the zero, one, 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 one for the F. So now I have selected this location. I can now see everything that is coming from this line. <coughs> you can see the location is now selected. But because I am writing this, writing this location, so LD needs to be a zero. Okay, so this is correct. But the zero is negated by the dot gauge here to become a one. The one is now connected to the input to the output. In other words, it's connecting the input pin that specifies the content, the new content of the location to the data port, which is now acting as an input. So as soon as I go as soon as soon as the clock goes from zero to one, it is um, the content of the input pin here is now changed to only one. So location set up. Yeah, in this case, the output is always going to show. So if you want the output not to show this, you know, like it shows this and it exits, then you need another control buffer. Uh, yeah. But it's not necessary because you know, whoever is reading the output of the RAM can just read it. Because remember, in order for a register to update the content, the register has to be enabled first. So that means if the 
other side is connected to a register that can be connected to a register. As long as the register is not enabled, it's not going to be used. So we can ignore an input quite easily. But having multiple outputs potentially to fight over something, that's something that we have to manage. All right. So we are out of time, almost out of time today, but I have just gone over all the other components that you need to understand in order to understand the different processor as a whole. So, so once again, you know, for those of you who came a little bit late, this is the entire processor. So we'll be using this processor from now all the way to the end of the semester. We'll be writing programs, you know, to run has 256 bytes of RAM. But we'll be able to write um, algorithms all the way up to um, Hanoi's Tower. The recursive version of Hanoi's Tower can actually be done using 256 bytes of RAM. So we'll do that, okay? Because you know, in this class, remember what I mentioned about the, difference, the differences between this class and the one Diablo College, they stretch the higher end, I stretch the lower end. So I'm trying to use the least amount of resources to demonstrate that, yes, we can do it even with this processor and 256 bytes of RAM. We can implement the recursive version of the tower algorithm. Or, you know, looking up the binary search tree and that kind of thing. So, so we'll be doing all of that stuff. Before we can do anything like that, it is important for us to understand you know, the components inside the processor. But we have just talked about everything that we need to know. If the RAM, if the ROM, we've got a whole bunch of multiplexers okay, all around. And then we also have a bunch of uh, registers too. So the registers are in the program counter. This is the micro point pointer. This is the flag register. And then inside the register bank, we have four general purpose registers. So those are the registers. And then there are plenty of D multiplexers, okay? These are D multiplexers. The multiplexer, this is one bigger multiplexer. This is another multiplexer, and so on and so forth. Okay. PC, um, this is called PC mux because it is used to control a multiplexer itself. So that's why this is called PC box box because it is used to control the multiplexer where the output controls another multiplexer. <laughs> and then this ROM has, okay, so if you look at the content of this particular ROM, it is, okay, let me do this again. It is mostly empty because I overplanned a little bit that I have uh, made available. But these locations are very important because even though they look almost the same, they are slightly different by a little bit, um, they basically orchestrate the connection between all of the multiplexers and the demultiplexers. We'll talk about this, okay? We'll talk about it in small steps, okay? So we'll talk about how to use the instruction that is stored in Get to that sometime next week, possibly a little bit on this Wednesday. Okay, but most likely you know, on next Monday. Yep, that's the good thing. And then we talk about that. You mean condensing in terms of actual physical design? Yes. So this is all logistic. This is all completely you know, in logistic. So as it is, we can even see it run. Okay, because basically we have to do a load balancing method. We'll talk more about that. But for those of you who are just curious, you can turn the tick frequency to something that you understand the action time. So you can actually act, at least get something, see something blinking. Then you can go ahead and enable the tick. So the processor is actually working right now. It's doing something that's completely useless, which is executing all the no op instructions, no op specified. So it's really not doing anything productive, but you
but you can see all the things you know, things such as picking and moving and changing and stuff like that. So we'll be using this processor for the rest of this semester. So we'll we'll present C code and then we'll translate it into instructions that this processor understands. Okay, so those instructions So some of you will be asking, but what about the ROM then? The ROM stores in sub-instruction. So for each one of the instructions that you store in RAM, there are multiple, potentially multiple locations in the ROM that are the smaller steps, and that's why this is often called microcode. Because if this is code, this is code to implement the code. So that's why it's called microcode, because it is the smaller of the code. So we'll get get to all this later, but I just want to give you kind of like an overview of why we are talking about this stuff because these are the components that we need to understand in order to get the processor understood. All right, so on to today's lab. So, so today's lab is called components of the processor, and then on Wednesday we're going to have more of those that stuff, which is more processor components. So this is today's access code. And the access code is edgy. E D G Y. And you can write it on the board. So and I think it is already published. They change it, but not, not in the not in the current implementation. All right. So this one, you know, to do this homework or do this lab, it is probably helpful to run logisim build the circuit, and then to understand the 